انا اسمي محمد الحراري استشاري قلب كارديولوجست في الامارات لمده من حوالي سنتين قبل يعني كنت في اليو كي فرصه سعيده جدا لي اني اكون معاكم وهذا في المشروع العظيم والله مشروع ممتاز انا شفته وفرحت بهلبه بلغنا لي صديقي ناجي ادريس تشرفني اني اشارك ببعض الشيء انا ناجي اقترح اني كل حاجه على السي جي فانا قلت نبدا بالمحاضره هذه اللي هي ذا بيزك اوف سي جي سو ذا ستار ذا ليكشر از جوينت تو بي ان انجلش ماش بير وذ مي وات ام جوينت تو جو ثرو از ريلي جست جو ثرو ذا بيزك اوف سي جيز هاو سي جيز you know it's, it should be conducted how you interpret just even normal ecgs and go through a few examples and hopefully it be helpful if you get any question just just write them in the chat box and we'll go through them later uh, I, i try to make it not too long uh, hopefully maximum one hour uh, okay so we shall we, we just start um, now for some reason it's not Okay, so what we're going to talk is, as I said, the basic of the ECG and its interpretation. So we'll give a, a, a lecture in summary, and I'll give some quiz at the end, just go through it. Um, so really, the, the, the idea of doing this talk or lecture is to, for you or us to understand the principles of ECG and how it is perform, performed. Um, and describe the conduction system of the heart and its relation to uh, ECG and how this you form, what these waves means in relation to the conduction system. Um, and then we go through the ECG itself, how you read it, uh, uh, the, the, the basic of calibration of the ECG recording. It's very important that when you look at ECG, make sure it is calibrated correctly. All ECG should be at speed at 25 millimeter per second and the, and the voltage should be uh, one, one millivolt per, per, per one centimeter. So if, if, and this you can change it. So the, somebody played with a machine and it can change the speed to 50 or whatever. And if you make it 50, the, the QRS will look very narrow, close to each other. And you think the patient has tachycardia and vice versa. And the voltage also, if you change it from the 10 millimeter um, per one millivolt, if you change it, increase it, um, the, the voltage will look too big. And you think the patient has a, you know, an hypertrophy when he doesn't. And you can make it too small. You think the patient has some problem. Tambunar or something. So really make sure the calibration is correct and, and, and give you some simple rules or ideas or how to easily calculate the heart rate because you should, should not rely on the machine telling you the heart rate. You should practice how to um, measure it yourself. It goes some of the ECG changes in myocardial functions, part of the reading ECGs, and try to give you um, simple um, ideas if possible to how to work out the cardiac axis and why we do that anyway. If time allows us, we'll go into quickly into left on the right on the back block left injector hypertrophy. So, what is what is ECG? What is electrocardiogram or EKG, as the Americans say? It's basically it, it is uh, the heart is a bumping machine. It needs fuel, which is a blood, but also needs electricity to make it work. It's like a car. So you need the electricity first to work. So the electricity is the one the depolarization, as you probably learned in your medical school. The depolarization, the electroactivity that precedes the contraction is what we are measuring. So the heart makes electricity and, and, and we, can, we, can, we can measure it, we can read it by this ECG. And the, the, ECG, the, the, the ECG represents distinctive cardiac events. So each wave, this event, something, occur, something occurring, is it the atrium depolarizing, the ventricular depolarizing, whatever. So each wave has a meaning and going through this, can tell you, we can, we can tell, is this a normal thing? Is it a normal heart or is something missing or abnormal? Um, so why is it important? It's a fundamental part of the cardiovascular assessment. So once you have taken your good history and a good examination, you formulate an idea about what's wrong with the patient, you have to do tests. And one with cardiac tests is almost everyone with cardiac problem, even non-cardiac problem or preoperative you have to do an ECG, so it's an essential part. It's cheap, so it's non-invasive, it's safe to do. And what you look, you look for the rhythm. The, the patient has a normal rhythm or arrhythmia, or, um, so you cannot always be sure just from checking the pulse. And you look for cardiac ischemia. So whether a patient has symptoms related to cardiac ischemia, or even all, so you may find all changes till this patient had had or has had a, a cardiac event in the past, which may not, and the patient may not be aware of it. 
um, cantillary area by the cardiac chambers, if the, if the presence of left ventricular hypertrophy, if you're looking at the patient with hypertension or aortic stenosis. It can also give you an idea about whether the metabolic disorders, a patient with hyperkalemia, it's essentially due an ECG because abnormal ECG in the presence of hyperkalemia has increased your risk and there are signs, which is a peak T wave for hyperkalemia. And drug to to toxicity, so if you give somebody um, too much adjoxin, there, there are changes. There are drugs that can prolong your QT interval, which is risky, can cause arrhythmia. So by re redoing the ECG and reading this, it can tell whether this patient having too much of that drug or toxic of that drug and you can do something about it. Can be clues about other cases, somebody with a family, sink be family, family history of sudden death, if you do it, you see, that's leave you clues like brogadic or long QT, which is, could be congenital or other, other markers that can tell you some, give you an idea about clue about the diagnosis just by doing the ECG. This is the first ECG was done by uh, the great William in the Hoven. This was done in 1895. Look how he did it on himself. It's a you know, complicated machine and hardly managed to see a few graphs to the modern ECG that all of us have now, which is you know, even wireless. You just connect the machine, uh, the, the, the electrodes to the patient, and you read the ECG. It will give you so much information. So your, your, your normal ECG is uh, it's called 12 lead ECG because it's, 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 it's read by 12 leads, by 12 electrodes. So the, on the left side, there are the limb leads. So lead one, two, three, and lead AVR, AVL, AVF. These are the limb bleeds, which we'll go through them later on, which looks at the heart in the vertical plane. So you like, like a frame, like a buruas, a frame and the heart in, in, in the middle. So you look at in the vertical plane. So you look at the left and right, and the heart is in the horizontal. You can look at the axis um, um, of the heart, while the, the other six leads are chest leads, V1 to V2, V3, V4, V5. These are look at the heart in the horizontal plane. So the, the electrodes attach to the front of the heart and look at the horizontal heart from the right side all the way to the left. Um, so, so we look at the heart from all angles and they all add up more information. So, um, so when you read the ECG, you have to have a look at it, you have to have a checklist in your mind. If, if, you, if you don't know what you're looking for, you'll never find it. And if you just look at, to look for something abnormal and say, oh, this looks abnormal, and you see, that's the wrong way to do it. You'll miss a lot. You have to have a checklist. You have to have a, things that I'm going to, when I go read it, you see, I have to look at all these things. And the first thing you look at the name, it's very infrequent, not infrequent, that actually you'll be looking at the wrong patients. So you make sure you look at the name of the patient, that oh, patient in front of you that you were talking about. Make sure it is the same date. You're not looking at all the ECG and, and managing the patient based on all the ECG. Yeah, as I said to you before, you have to check that the speed and the voltage are calibrated correctly. And then you, you work out the rate, the rhythm. Make sure one of the easiest things to say is this patient's sinus rhythm. Sinus rhythm is, there is a P wave preceding each QRS. If you see a P wave preceding QRS, each QRS, one P wave, then QRS, that's a normal sinus rhythm. Otherwise, this is abnormal rhythm. Um, then you look at all the components of the AC. You have to look at the B wave, PR interval, QRS, QT. We'll go through what, what you need to look at in each of these. And you can do work cardiac, cardiac axis. Look at the ST segment. That's very important in cardiac ischemia. And then is there a bundle bunch block? Is there left ventricular hypertrophy, right ventricular hypertrophy? And then once you have, have this information, look at all ECG because you might find abnormality. That is all present there in the past. It does not. It has no relevance to what's going on with your patient now, if the ECG changes are old. So as I said, the, the ECG is actually uh, reads the electric activity. The electric activity is the depolarization. The, the electric activity before the um, chamber, whether atrium or ventricle contracts. So um, your electrodes look at the heart from different angles. As I said, the, the chest is from the interior right to left, the, the, the limb bleeds uh, like frame, uh, up left arm, up right arm, and left leg. And the lead, if you look at it, particularly the looking at the, at the myocardium, look at the heart, if the electricity coming towards it, suppose you're putting a lead at the apex of the heart, and the electricity, as we'll mention later on, start from the sinus node, goes downward, the AV node goes up the, toward the apex, so electricity goes from top to bottom, and if your lead at the, at the apex, toward the apex, like left side or left leg, 
So electricity coming towards this will be um, recorded as upward um, deflection. So it looks upward. If you lead actually on the other side, if you lead in the right arm and the electricity going from the other side is not toward the apex, away from it, it will be represented as a negative wave. If your leads halfway through, like, like here, then when the electricity starts here, it will look at coming towards it, so you record it as a positive, but the electricity quickly goes, start going away from it, becomes negative, so it becomes like biphasic. And if you have leads uh, across the whole chest, like the, 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 the chest leads, which mentioned V1 to V6, and the electricity is coming from, uh, from the, from the uh, right, a, a, uh, right side top part going to the left. So the, 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 the leads on the right side will, will have a, a very small, if any, a positive deflection and have predominantly negative deflection, while the leads on the left side will have a positive deflection and the leads in the, in the middle will show progress, um, uh, um, getting a bigger R wave. And that's important when you look at the leads. If, it, if this is absent, there's something wrong with the art. There's no progressive increase of the R wave. And the size of the deflection, the size of the deflection reflect usually, usually uh, how, how close your leads to the ventricle, but also how uh, the heart, and also how big is the heart. So in cases like hypertension or our stenosis, the left ventricle is so big, so it produces a lot of electricity, so they give you a higher voltage. So the, 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 uh, that positive wave looks quite big. And that can tell you the deflection has some sort of hypertrophy. And just again, just maybe I repeat this several times because it's important how the electricity starts. You all know the heart sits in your chest and usually slightly tilted to the left, the atria toward the back and the, uh, the ventricle toward, uh, toward, toward the front and more to the left side, so rotated to the left uh, and, and tilted downward. So and the electricity always starts in the sinus node. So the sinus node is the one that starts, it's the base maker, it's the one that makes the heartbeat. And then electricity goes through the atrial chamber, through the chamber itself. The chamber of the atria, as you know, is thin walled. So it conducts electricity quickly. So it causes then cause depolarization of the atria. And that's if you lead on the left side, as I said, pointing upward towards the heart, the electricity going to the, that electrode will be positive. So you see a small positive deflection called the P wave. And then the electricity will stop at the AV node. The AV node causes delay and it say wait. And why is doing that? To allow time for the atria to contract before the ventricle. Otherwise, electricity spreads quickly. The whole heart will contract at the same time. And it's not good physiologically because you need the atria to empty the ventricle before the ventricle gets contracted. So there is that. Uh, delay in the AV node. After that, the electricity goes through the uh, through the through the, through a, a wires, through electric wires. So the bundle of his bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers. Why? Because the ventricle is not like the atrium; it's thick wall and it does not conduct electricity well. So if you leave it like the atria, it will take a long time for electricity to go through the heart for heart to contract. So these wires, Subhanallah, is the yeah, connected throughout the myocardial system, from top to bottom bundle phase, and then we got right and left bundles, bundles, and the left bundle splits into anterior and posterior, and then they go into the into the walls as Purkinje fiber. So electricity very quickly go into all the, the all the all the, all the ventricle very quickly. And if you have a lead again, so a, 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 a electrode again at the down, it will all be look positive, big waves, which is the R wave that you see here. Okay. But just a quick reminder, that this, this Q wave, which you see even those leads, because the electricity in the ventricle is produced predominantly by the left ventricle, because the left ventricle is bigger than the right ventricle, much thicker than the, than the, than the right ventricle. Uh, and the septum, which is part of the left ventricle, it's not part of the right ventricle, is, is actually stimulated from left to right. So that, and because from this quick thing of quick left to right, then it, it reflects that electricity initially going away, it gives you these small Q waves, uh, which will go through them again. So then you give this R wave. This is the end of uh, debolarization of the ventricle. And there is a, a, a small uh, flat line called the ST segment after the end of the S wave. And that's before the rebolarization, which is the T wave. Okay. 
So it's important that we may go through this again and again because you just to remember what these waves means and how they are coming and why it is positive, why it's negative. And so you got the your P wave, which is represents atrial depolarization, the QRS, the ventricular depolarization, the T wave ventricular depolarization. Somebody may ask, where is the the, the atrial uh, repolarization. It, it, it's not shown because it occurs in the middle of the QRS, in the middle of the ventricular depolarization, so it is masked. So you need to remember that, subhanAllah, uh, the, the, the sinus node has a, 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 a automatic autonomous uh, rate between 60 and 100, so it does send signal at that rate. It goes slower if you sleep, it goes faster if you do exercise, you're shocked or whatever. Uh, but that, that's the rate. But if the sinus node suddenly stop, uh, subhanAllah, we have the, the AV node itself can take over and, and give you a backup rate, but a slower rate, 40 to 60. And, and, and even that that goes off, the ventricle cells can have a backup rate of 20 to 40. Just you, you need to know these, these, the sites, uh, these are, they can take over and, and stimulate the heart spontaneously. Okay, so I'm just going to the leads. You have to know and make sure that the leads are put appropriately. The chest leads, not infrequent, even in Europe, everywhere, the leads, somebody just put the leads right, left, and just put them towards the axilla, and that's it. You have to make sure they are put in exactly the right position, otherwise the information you get it may, may be wrong. So we all know V1 is actually put in the uh, fourth integral space, just to the right of the sternum, the um, V2, fourth intercostate just to the left of the of the sternum uh, v4 is in the midclavicular line in the fifth intercostal space v3 in between v2 and v4 v5 and 6 in the fifth intercostal space and the anterior axillary line and the mid axillary line so it's very important you put in that position and you know this this give you the 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 uh, the, uh, the, uh, the chest leads which as i said to you before look at the heart in the horizontal plane you can see the heart um, there that's the position in the in the body atrium in the back ventricle uh, pointing more towards the left and downward, and the your chest leads are going from V1 to V4 to V6 anteriorly. So if you look at the V1, looking more toward the right side, so when, the, when there is um, 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 depolarization of the ventricle, it actually will give you a negative signal because actually it's going away, the signal is going away from that v, v, uh, V1. But if you look at V6 and V5, the electricity is coming towards it, so predominantly the depolarization of the ventricle of the ventricle uh, will be positive. And, and in, in leads like v, V2 or V3, almost perpendicular, and that will be equiphasic. It will be a bit of R, but positive and bit of negative. And if you look at the leads from V1 to V6, normally should slowly get be getting a bigger R wave, and that's important. Absence of that could indicate old myocardial function. So um, um, what about the limb leads? The limb leads, um, the, the, the chest leads are unipolar, but while the limb leads, um, they are uh, two, one and two and three are bipolar leads. What mean bipolar? Means they've got two electrodes, two electrodes uh, measuring the tension between them. So lead one, you attach to the right arm, left arm, and measures from the left side. And uh, lead, lead two, attached to the left arm and left leg, uh, sorry, lead, uh, lead two, uh, right, right, right arm and left leg, lead three, left arm and left leg. It's very important to know this. The, the, if I said to you, the, the limb leads, look at the heart in, in a vertical vein. So you see the heart there in the middle and you look at the heart in, 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 in a vertical compared to the horizontal vein that, uh, that, that the um, chest leads use. The AVR, AVL, AVF are what's called augmented unipolar leads. So they are basically unipolar lead with reference to the center of the heart. Um, so AVR is attached to the right arm, uh, left uh, AVL to the left arm, AVF to the left uh, left leg. And if you uh, important, so anatomically, so when you say the chest leads, look at the anterior wall. So there is abnormality, particularly in this T segment, like ischemia infarction. You can say this is anterior ischemia or anterior infarction. While leads like two, three, and AVF, which they are look at the heart from below, they look at the inferior wall. So ischemia or infarction changes in, this, in those leads tell you that the, the problem is actually in the inferior wall of the heart. Um, so uh, just this, this again, just a reminder, like one, two, three, these are the limb bleeds, and they look at the, ver uh, and, uh, the, the vertical plane. 
And also, if you look at these leads, um, lead, lead two almost in line with the, with the heart and looking from the bottom. So this will give you the positive, most positive. All electric activity lead two will be positive because atrial debolization, ventricular debolization, all going towards the, that lead. So all, all the B wave, QRS, and T wave should be positive that lead. While if you look at the VR, almost opposite, all the electricity going away from it. So all the waves will be negative. So B, QRS, and T will be inverted in this VR. Well, if you look at the lead, lead three, this is perpendicular to the heart. So it'll be equiphasic, so a bit, a bit positive, a bit negative. Um, lead one in, in between AVF and the inferior wall. Um, yeah, just saying exactly what I said to you. Okay. Now, it's important um, to just looking at the, the, the limb bleeds. I said they look at the heart in the vertical plane and at certain angles, and this is the angle we use to measure the axis. So lead one is used as a reference because I said it's connected to the uh, right arm and left arm and measured from the left arm. So it's actually at, at, at zero angle. Um, while, while lead, lead two, 60 degree, lead, uh, lead three, 120 degree. And if you look at the uh, augmented leads, AVR right arm, so it's, one, it's 150 degree, AVL at minus 30, and AVF at, and, at, at plus 19. If you put them all together, that gives you all the angles. And the heart anatomically lies, bet lies between minus 30 and plus 90. This is normal axis. So the heart usually around plus 60, yeah, in line with lead two, as we said. So any deviation to the left, that would be left axis. So minus 50, minus 60, minus, minus 90 will be left axis. Deviation to the right, uh, above one, uh, above plus 90 will be right, uh, right, uh, right axis deviation. Or 120, 130 will be right axis deviation. So as we said, anatomically, uh, the, the two, three, and F are looking at the heart from below. So these are called inferior leads. Uh, V1 to V6 are anterior leads. But if you find change limited to the, what are called lateral leads, which is V5, V6, and A1 and AVL, will be lateral changes. That's important, really, in ischemia and infarction more than anything else. Um, so we said to you, it's important to look at the calibration of your paper. So the paper should run by 25 millimeter per second, which means that one, one millimeter is 40 uh, milliseconds. So the, this tiny, very tiny, tiny square, one millimeter, is one, each one is 40 milliseconds. While five of them, which is in that, that big square, is 200 milliseconds. And if you take five of these big one, will be one second. Um, and then the voltage is calibrated as one millivolt is one centimeter, which is two, two of these squares. So each of these tiny squares is 0.1 millimeter. I'm sorry, 0.1 millivolt. So each small square is 0.1 millivolt. Uh, the, the big square is one millivolt. Um, so I said to you before, the amplitude of the, of the R wave, how big it is related to the, to, the, to the mass, how big is the ventricle, but also related to the, how far is your electrodes from, your, um, from the heart itself. So condition that can give you a, a very small voltage, which is not correct, is if somebody is very obese, so the electrode is really far from the heart, have some airway disease, lung disease, or have fluid around the heart, like pericardial fusion. I'll give a small QRS. If somebody, we see they see very, very small, you have to worry. Unless the patient is obese uh, or has bad symphysia, you may have to think about pericardial fusion. Um, um, what gives you a big, uh, big uh, amplitude uh, R waves is a few things. Some physiological, somebody is very, very slim, young, very slim, and they chose very close to heart because he's slim. That can give you a big R wave, does not necessarily indicate the um, uh, thickness of the ventricles. But otherwise, if you have to think about thickening of the ventricle, which could be due to hypertension or valvular heart disease, particularly aortic stenosis. So just a quick reminder that you have, when you look at the C, look at the speed, just a quick look at the speed, make sure 25 millimeters per second, make sure the calibration is 10, milli, 10, milli, 10 millimeter per volt, milli, per millivolt. Okay, let's go a few, uh, through uh, various components of the ECG. So B wave, we said it is, um, atrial, atrial depolarization. Okay, the, when you look at the, the, the B wave, you need to make sure it is not 
uh, prolonged, it's not wide, it's, it's not more than three small squares, and it's not too high, not more than two and a half square high, the voltage. Um, and I said to you, because that AVR, look from the right side, D wave is always negative in that lead, while it is always positive in lead one and lead two. If it's not, then something is wrong. Um, and it's the best lead, as I said, in all, when you look at P waves or even uh, R wave is lead two, because it's in line with the heart. It should be always positive. So, so what abnormality of P waves you can, you can detect from the ECG? So if you look at ECG and just focus on the P waves, and as we said, the best lead to look at is the lead two. If you look at lead two here, the B wave look big compared to the R wave. It's nearly as high as the R wave and tall and peaked. And this is called P pulmonary. So this P pulmonary indicates right atrial enlargement. You see this, late, this ambition with chronic obstructive airway disease and pulmonary hypertension. So just by looking at this, you can say this man has a large right, right atrium. You did not do an echo just by looking at this. And if you'll find the B wave like this one, look broad and, and vivid. And this, this is, this is a lead to, this is left atrial enlargement. And why it is vivid twice? Because the first one is the right atrium, the first, the, and the other one is the left atrium. But it's wide. And this is called B mitrali. And this is very common as causes mitral stenosis, so dilated left atrium. Again, just looking at this, you can tell this man has a, the left left atrium or the large left atrium. So remember, P mitrali, tall peak P wave. B, uh, B mitrali, vivid, prolonged, more than three squares uh, B, uh, P wave. Um, PR interval. The PR interval is the measurement of the length, it's just time between the beginning of the P wave and the beginning of the um, QRS. So the beginning of atrial depolarization to the beginning of um, uh, ventricular depolarization. The importance of this, of, this, of this interval is the length of it. So, as I said, there is a, this, this slide uh, delay you're allowed, which is up to five squares, 200 milliseconds. That's physiological to allow the atrium to contract for the ventricle. But if it is longer than that, then there is a, a block. So, the condu conduction block. So, it, if it's just a prolonged PR interval, called first degree heart block. Okay? While shortened PR wave, this means there's abnormality, there's an accessory pathway, there's a a detour, there's a, 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 a pathway that should not be there that making a shortcut. Um, so just again, so the, uh, the PR interval should be between uh, uh, 120 and 200 milliseconds, between three squares and five squares. So if it is, as I said, it's this, uh, this is atrial depolarization and we said it's Y to allow the ventricle. Uh, so this is short PR interval. So if you look at look here, shower and, and PR interval, and why is this happening in this case? This is a case a condition you probably know called Wolf Parkinson White syndrome, where if you look at here to the top um, diagram, there's an, an extra accessory pathway in addition to the AV node that the patient is born with that's conduct electricity quick through the uh, cross across between the atrium and the ventricle, which should normally go only through the AV uh, node, but go through here and it stimulates the um, ventricle early, causing the shortening of the PR interval and causing the slurring of the upstroke of the R wave called delta wave. And so this is, if you see this, this man has World Parkinson White syndrome, and if you have patient palpitation, then this is, you probably got the diagnosis just by looking at the ECG, and the treatment, you probably know, is ablation therapy, but it's just by looking at the ECG, you can tell. Now, if there's a, a delay due to um, disease or drugs, between the conduction between the ventricle, atrium and ventricle, called prolonged of the PR interval more than 200 milliseconds, and that's called first degree heart block. What about the QRS complexes? So the QRS complexes is, is the, as I said before, is the depolarization of the ventricle. If you look at the, uh, our ideal lead, which is lead two, which is in line with the, with the heart, which is look at the heart from the bottom. So initially you see a, a tiny, very small key wave because the ventricle septum is stimulated from the left to the right. So it just appeared to go away uh, initially, just giving that small flick uh, key wave, but then it will go all the way through the Purkinje system to debilize the ventricle downwards, so it's all big positive R wave. 
And then, well, then the base of the heart is stimulated, which is backward, gives you a small negative wave called S wave. So these, these are the components, the QRS complexes. You need to look at the Q waves. Is it present, not present, how big it is? Because big uh, uh, Q waves or pathological Q waves indicate either recent or old myocardial infarction. Um, and also the R waves we mentioned before, if it is too big, that's the ventricular hypertrophy. If it is not progressing well, if it is short, small, but should be big, that may indicate old myocardial damage. And also you look at the duration of the QR. It should be more, not more than three squares, 120 millisecond. And uh, prolongation is called band the branch clock. Um, so I think it's just, uh, so the, again, the best lead you look at lead two, it should be less than three, um, three squares. And if it is wide, indicate, and, and yeah, wide becomes wide. I said to you before, the electricity in the ventricle goes, to, it has to go through this, through this wire, through this Burkinji fibers, and a bundle of his, because that's the electric wire, fast conduction. If that bundle, one of them is blocked, then the electricity has to go through the myocardium, go through myocardium, cause delay, cause wide of the QR is complex. And the same, if you've got an ectopic coming from the ventricle, because the ectopic coming from the ventricle, premature beats, it, it goes through the myocardium because it's, it's coming from the myocardium. It goes through myocardium, and that's why it produces a wider QRS than a normal beat coming from the atrium. And the same for if somebody goes ventricular tachycardia, by default, the QRS would be wide because it, it, it's produced by myocardium, it, it transmits through myocardium to stimulate the rest of the myocardium, and it is slower, even though the heart is faster, but the electricity itself takes it longer to conduct to the whole myocardium, give you wider QRS. So as we mentioned to you, the, 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 the Q wave, somebody asked you, what's Q wave? So the Q wave is the first negative uh, wave uh, after the P wave. So that's, the, that's, the, that's, the, that's called the Q wave, okay? Um, and the R wave, any, any positive, uh, any positive uh, wave in the QRS is called R wave. You have, it may have more than one. Uh, and the S wave is the negative wave that comes after the R. So, as, as I mentioned before, the, the septum stimulates from the left to the right, and that's what gives you the initial small key waves in the left side of these, like L2. Um, V1 and V2 are actually on the right side, and hardly, and they, they will have a predominantly, they may have a small R wave, and then, and then keeps somebody scribbling on my talk, uh, and a small, uh, small R wave followed by, uh, followed by deep S wave. So you need to, you need to remember, uh, that what differentiate uh, a normal small physiological Q wave to a pathological? If the Q wave is if the Q wave is, is, is wide, if it is more than two squares, that's abnormal, and that's indicate previous myocardial infarction. Or if it is uh, uh, so, if it is sorry, if it is two, 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 more than two squares deep, sorry, if it is more than one square wide or more than two squares deep, that's pathological. Or if this if the of the of the Q wave is more than quarter of the, uh, sec of the R wave, like quarter of the size of the R wave, and also pathological. So, so pathological U wave, either it's too deep, more than two square, too wide, more than one square, or more than quarter of the R wave. That's pathological, except lead three. Lead isolated Q wave lead three is physio physiological, you're allowed, and it's to do with the position of the heart, and if you want it to disappear, take another ECG with the patient, take a deep breath, and we'll find that QF lead is goes away. So we see a lot of times people label to have an old myocardial, inferior myocardial infarction because they have QFs only in lead three, which is physiological. If it is all the inferior myocardial infarction, you will get QFs in lead two and F, AVF as well as lead three. So as I mentioned before, the chest leads are very important to look at to look at the progression of the R wave. So the, your R wave should be starting as small and in V1 and go bigger and bigger and bigger because of the position of these leads, like look at, uh, uh, so position of these electrodes looking at the heart. And when the, the, the left sided electrodes V5, V6 are predominantly positive, give you big, uh, big R wave, while the V1 on the right side give, give you predominantly negative S wave. And if you don't see progression, lack of progression of R wave that indicates all myocardial infarction. Okay, let's talk about the ST segment. So the ST segment is the segment between the end of the S wave and the beginning of the T wave. So the, end, the junction 
of the S wave to the T wave to this T segment called G, J point. And you have to look at that and see whether it is the importance of this T segment is its level. It's not the duration, but it's the level. Uh, is, it, is it isoelectric? Isoelectric means it should be at the same level as the interval between the T and B wave called TB segment. So you look at the ST segment and look at the TB segment. Are they same level or not? If the ST segment is down, that probably indicates ischemia or strain, which is up in the context of good history, that it can indicate myocardial infarction. Um, yeah. So look here, if you look at this graph, this ST segment depression. And if you look at this, when you look at ST segment depression, so this is G point, it's quite depressed, the ST segment is down. When you look at this segment, you say, is it significant or not significant? There are many factors with the history, but also when you look at the ECG, the more ECG showing ST segment depression, the more likely that the, what you see is very significant. Also, that the shape of the ST segment, if the ST segment is pointing upward, is less important, less significant than if the ST segment is horizontal or down sloping. And the degree of this is this segment. So two or is less significant than compared to three or four. What about ST segment elevation? Segment elevation usually is a marker of a myocardial infarction. And the, the changes of the ST segment in acute myocardial, myocardial infarction, as you probably know, the first earliest sign is actually big T waves. So if somebody comes with acute chest pain and you have a big, big tall T waves and say the anterior release, then this, lady, this patient has probably early anterior myocardial infarction. That's followed by elevation of this ST segment, and then probably the Q waves and later T wave reversion. So this is time sequence of the events of acute ST segment. ST segment elevation, as you know, due to occlusion, transmural myocardial infarction, due to occlusion, total occlusion of the coronary artery. While non ST segment is due to partial occlusion, and that's usually caused ST segment depression. And important to look at when you look at the ST segment, you look which is showing the ST segment elevation or depression, and then give you anatomical mark. So if you look at this this ECG, um, you may agree with me that there are ST segment elevation in the two, three, and AVF. And as we mentioned before, these are inferior leads. So this man, this patient has inferior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Action. So it's important to look at the segment and which site they are. While this patient has ST segment elevation in V2, 3, V4, V5, V6. And these are anterior leads. So it's anterior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. I can add to it, I can say this anterolateral. You can say why you're saying that? Because AVL and lead one, if you remember, remember these are looking at the left side, lateral side of the heart. So these are lateral leads. And this can this indicate lateral myocardial infarction. So some, some patients can represent only with lateral myocardial infarction. They can have ST segment elevation only in lead one, AVL, and, V5, and V6. These are lateral ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Well, this is clearly an anterolateral. The one before was inferior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. It's another example of anterior ST segment myocardial infarction. What about the T wave? T wave, as we said, it is, it is a, it's a repolarization of the ventricle. Um, it, um, the important the, looking at the T wave, it's not the, it's not the duration, it's more, it's more the shape of it. Usually, the T wave direction will be almost always in the same direction of the FDR. The R is positive, the T wave should be positive. So, lead two, always positive uh, as the R, while in AVR, and maybe lead uh, V1 can be negative. So, a tall T wave, as we said before. Could be a marker like V2 here, look, big, big R wave, T wave, sorry, bigger than the, even the R wave. This uh, could be an early marker of myocardial infarction, but somebody with renal disease and you did, this could be a sign of hyperkalemia. And if you find ECG, the changes from hyperkalemia, that's really patient at risk of dying, so you don't need to correct the potassium. Okay, what about this QT interval? QT is a measurement of the interval between the beginning of the Q wave and the end of T wave. So this is a, a what? This is depolarization plus repolarization of the ventricle. So the total electric activity of the ventricle. And the, the, the importance of measuring the QT interval is actually when it is long, it could be a marker or risk of arrhythmias. Um, so it, it normally, again, it's best, you always, any, any, any wave is best uh, seen in lead two, really. Um, and it should be half 
not more than half the RR interval or less than 460 milliseconds. Um, and if it, is, if it is long, it can be precipitate arrhythmia. Prolonged QT interval could be congenital, could be drug-induced like tricyclic depressant or metabolic like hyperkalemia. There's a long list, of course, long list of medications, but important for you to spot it when it is there. Okay, let's give us some, um, go through how you measure your heart rate. Um, heart rate, normally somebody at rest should be less, uh, between 60 and 100, less than 60 brady, more than 100, uh, more than 100 is tacky. Um, simple way of measuring it is, is to look at the number of large um, uh, uh, squares uh, between the RR intervals. You choose any RR interval, best again lead two, uh, or you have, should have a rhythm strip at the bottom of the ECG, usually lead two. Look at the number of the big uh, QRSs, you know, the small, each, 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 each square, or each big square has a five small squares. So you look at the number of the big squares and 300 divided by the number of big squares. That's if the patient is in sinus rhythm. Okay, um, we'll go through a few examples. Uh, but if the rhythm is irregular, then it becomes difficult because you cannot rely on the, the number of squares between two RR when they are irregular. In that case, you take, um, take five of these large squares, and you remember each square is 200 milliseconds, so five large squares is one second. So you take, count the number of, this, uh, of the R, R interval inside five squares, which is one second, and multiply by 60. So one six times 60. So number of squares, a uh, uh, number of R, 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 R waves inside five squares, which is one second times 60, give you the heart rate per minute. So this is a regular heart, heart um, uh, rhythm. I see it's normal sinus rhythm because the P wave and QRS. If you want to measure number of large squares, two here, so 300 divided by two is 150. So the heart is 150. While here, um, look at the number of large squares, one, two, three, four, five, six. So 300 divided by 60 is 50. So that's bradycardia. So simple, just two number of large squares. They're very easy to do. 300 divided by number of large squares between the RR and RR. I guess another example, same thing, 300 divided by 60. Um, here again, it's one, three and a half. Large squares, 300 divided by four, three and a half, four, 75. If you say, oh, I cannot, they are not accurate. It's not really a number of large square, it's not exactly four. You can measure the number of the smallest square, but then you have to do 1500, 1500 uh, divided by the, uh, uh, by the number of, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, by the, uh, by, in, by, the, by the number of these small squares. 1500 divided by the number of very, very small squares. But sometimes difficult, the easy way, just look at the number of large squares, 300 divided by, by the number of those squares between. Again, this patient has a tachycardia, wide complex, probably even tachycardia. You can say this may be, well, maybe one and a half. So 300 divided by one and a half, 200. Or you can measure this tiny squares and then 1500 divided by number of small squares. Well, if it is, if it is irregular, as we said, really, you take the number of, uh, num uh, take the, number of the R, R, R waves inside five squares. So these are five squares, one, two, three, five, five squares. Each square is 200 milliseconds, so the five square is one second. So you, you got three uh, R waves in one second. So in 60 seconds, three times 60, that gives you the rate 180 per minute. So that's the way of measuring it. There's another rule called the 10 second rule. All ECGs that you, we, we do actually measured in 10 seconds. So the beige in front of you is 10 seconds. So you have a, a rhythm strip at the bottom, and you can measure the number, all the, Q, all the R waves inside your ECG beige uh, uh, and, the, uh, and, and, and multiply by six, by six. So it's 10 seconds. So beige here, this whole beige is 10 seconds, okay? All of it is 10 seconds. So you measure all of them, all squares, and these are 10 seconds. So if you multiply by six, that's six seconds. That tell you the heart rate per minute. So here in this patient has a pretty excited um, AF, but that's not a topic. So you got 33 R waves inside the beige. You multiply by six if you want to do it that way. That's for a regular rhythm. So this is called a 10 second rule. Um, the rhythm for you really, for you to just to know, you have to see a nice P wave followed by QRS E all the way. If you see that, that's a normal rhythm. You really have to just look at that. Otherwise, it's not normal rhythm. 
So this is your sinus rhythm. You wave before following QRS, followed by QRS, sorry. Something called sinus arrhythmia, which is a physiological thing. So if you check your pulse now and take a deep breath, you find your heart, your heart goes faster when you breathe in. So sometimes it can be very marked on the ECG. So the heart looks faster and, it's, and it's slower. And yeah, but it's physiological. Okay, we'll try to go through cardiac axis, a bit complicated. So not that relevant, but it has importance, really. So um, um, the axis of the heart represents the overall uh, direction of the heart, electricity, in the vertical plane. So we, the axis measures in the vertical plane, not in the horizontal plane, horizontal plane. We don't measure it by looking at the chest leads. We look, we look at the limb leads. One, two, three, uh, sorry, one, two, three, AVR, AVL, AVF. With the zero reference, lead one, which is zero. That's zero. That's how we measure it from those lands. And we, we have to measure the, the direction of activity. And wh why we do that? It can give you an idea with the ventricular enlargement. Say, if the, if the right ventricle is quite hypertrophied, the electricity will be shifted to the left. So you'll have left axis deviation. If, you, if the right ventricle is quite hypertrophied, the electricity will be shifted to the right, give you right axis deviation. And also, if you've got conduction block, as you mentioned to you, the electricity conducted in the ventricle through Purkinje. Uh, fibers and uh, bundle of his, and it, it, there's a right bundle uh, um, stimulating the right ventricle, left bundle stimulating the left ventricle, and the left bundle divided into anterior and, and, and posterior. So if these are blocked, the electricity will be shifted to the other side. So if the right bundle branch block causes left axis, right left bundle causes right axis, and, and so on and so forth. So it can give you an idea that it's something wrong. So again, if you look at the heart in this vertical plane and yeah you just have to remember um, where each lead points to and what's the degree so lead one always zero lead vf is always plus 90 and um, lead two plus 60 lead three plus 120 uh, avr minus minus uh, minus uh, 30 AV, avl minus 30 sorry and avr is, is uh, uh, plus 150 uh, and the, the normal axis is between minus 30 and 90, so between AVL and AVF. If it goes more to the left, less than minus 30, called left axis, goes more than positive 190, 190 120, 130, whatever, then the right, that's, uh, that's called right axis, okay? Now, how you measure it? The symbol rule that I use myself. So what you do really, look, look at this G. Look at lead one and lead two. If lead one and two, have the R wave is positive, this normal axis it can be clever. Just look at this lead one, lead two, both, both positive, tell them it's a normal axis. Don't, don't do anything more, nothing more, okay? Um, uh, while if lead one is negative and lead three is negative, uh, positive, sorry, so they are pointing to each other. If you look at lead one pointing downward while lead three pointing upward. So I, I say shaking hands. So lead one pointing down, lead three pointing up, shaking hands, it's called right. Shake hand by right hand. So right axis deviation. While if lead one is positive, pointing upward, and lead three uh, uh, negative, pointing downward, away from each other, this left axis deviation. Simple rule, you can look at it and you can apply it most to your patient. Normal, left, right. Um, so if you look at this, this ECG, lead one is positive. Lead two is positive. This is normal axis. Okay. This is normal axis. Don't do any more. Don't confuse yourself. While here, lead two, I'm not sure about. Lead one is negative. Lead three is positive. So one and three, they're always, when you see you done, you look at exactly like that. So look, lead one is pointing down, lead three pointing up. So shaking hands is right axis deviation. Um, and well, in this example, so this is positive, lead one positive, but lead two is not positive. So it's abnormal axis. So lead one is pointing upward, and lead three is pointing downward, so away from each other. This left axis deviation. Okay? This is really a simple rule. There's a, a more, slightly more complicated uh, rule called the equiphasic uh, approach. Um, and basically, you look at the lead that has uh, equiphasic uh, waves. What does that mean? That if you look at the R and negative and positive, they look more loss equal. So big, big R wave save three and S wave of three. So they are equiphasic. So, and look at that lead and then look at the lead perpendicular to it. So, and then, which means that you have to know which leads perpendicular to which. Uh, 
so uh, lead, lead one, the lead is perpendicular to it is AVF. Okay. Um, lead two, the lead perpendicular to lead AVL. Okay. Lead uh, three, perpendicular to AVR. So if you look at lead, say your lead one is have equiphasic, so the, the EQR is almost equal, then you, you, then you look at, then the axis will be perpendicular, will be AVF. If AVF is positive, then your axis is plus 90. If your uh, equiphasic lead, say lead three, so the R and this are equal, then your axis is actually pointing towards AVR. And if AVR is positive, then your axis is minus uh, 150. If it's positive, it'll be plus 30. So that's equiphasic. Bit tricky, let's use. I'll just quickly go through it. So here, almost lead two here, equiphasic. Okay, so as we said, lead two, the lead uh, perpendicular to it is AVL. So the axis is minus 30. Okay, um, here the lead equiphasic is lead one. So lead one perpendicular to it is AVF. So your lead, your axis is plus 90. Um, so you can look, <coughs> look, look at this lead, ACG, and <coughs> Here it says AVF is almost equiphasic, so the lead perpendicular to it is lead two, um, and lead two we know it's zero. Okay, so um, now I'm just going to go a few what they call the ten rules of ECG. This is like a summary. This is prof prof Professor Chamberlain's ten rules of ECG. So if you need to remember ten important rules in your head, these are the ten rules. Okay, so rule rule one: your PR interval should be between three to five squared, 120 to one to 200. So shorter, uh, longer than 200, first degree half block, shorter means there's present accessory vessel pathway. Rule two, <coughs> your QRS should not be more than 110 or 120. If it is, why, why the QRS, as it indicate, from the branch block. Um, rule three, um, the, the QRS complex should be always positive, lead one, lead two. If it's not, then it's something wrong with the ECG or there is, there is abnormal access. So abnormal, when I said something with your ECG means you put the least wrong way. And as I mentioned before, rule four, the Q, R, S, and T waves always uh, point to each other and uh, same. So if the Q, R, S is positive, the T wave should be positive and vice versa. And always look at AVR. AVR, I said it is actually from the right arm, actually looking away from the heart. The electricity going completely away from it. So all the waves should be negative. If it's positive, then you either your lead's wrong with some abnormality, like, <coughs> like right ventricular hypertrophy or, 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 or right bundle branch block. And as I mentioned several times um, today that you look at the R wave, this rule six, your R wave in the chest, it should progress. So look small R wave in V1 and get bigger, bigger, bigger. Maximum V5, V4 could be smaller than V6 if it is uh, in the back. Um, if it, that's not the case, that indicate previous damage, myocardial damage, usually myocardial infarction. Rule, six, uh, rule, rule seven, look at the ST segment, should be isoelectric. If it is down, can you get ischemia strain? If it is up, can you can indicate infarction? There's something called high takeoff or early liberalization, which we took maybe another time, but, but this general rule. And, 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 and you look, I always say, look at lead two, the best lead, to look at P waves. It should be upright. Upright lead one, V5, V6, only negative uh, B wave as in lead AVR can be also negative in V1, but should be both of lead two. Uh, rule nine, there should be no key waves, there are only small key waves um, in, in the uh, lead one, lead two, V and V uh, anterior leads. So, bridge of key waves, which we, as we said to you before, it's deeper than um, two segment or wider than one segment or more than quarter of the size of the R wave, that's pathological. Uh, rule 10, the T wave must be upright uh, like, that, that, like the R wave in lead two and V and T release. The inverted T wave could they indicate <coughs> ischemia. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll just go through a quiz which you can ask questions and then answer them uh, through what we discussed um, today uh, and then I, I'll go to other more, more slides if you have time, if, if I'm allowed to do them later. But just to do the quiz and then I'll stop. 
So, so the, the, the first question, um, can you bear um, um, these items correctly? Can you say, so item one, is P wave represent atrial depolarization? Yes or no, true or false? Q wave, definition of Q waves here says first positive deflection, okay? Item three, so you think about this while I'm going through them and I'll go back them, through them again with the answer. So the R wave should increase in V1 to six, increase. The S wave is the negative deflection after the R wave, true or false. The T